All right, good morning, men. So the question is, is Jesus God? And if so, how do we know? So to start off with, I wanted to turn to John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is Jesus speaking here. Actually, he's praying. Verse 1 says that after all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and he said, so he starts praying. In verse 3, I'm reading out of the NLT version. It says, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. So what is eternal life? To know the only true God and Jesus Christ. That's eternal life. You know, so eternal life is to know our God. And the question is, is Jesus God? We need to know that. And how can we know that? By studying scripture. So let's go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5. And let's see what God says about himself. Let's get to know our God. So Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 7. You must not have any other gods. You must not have any other God but me. The New King James Version says, you shall have no other gods before me. So what do we find out about God here? That he doesn't allow you to have any other gods. It's him or nothing. Deuteronomy 5.8, next verse down. You must not make for yourselves an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or the earth or the sea. You must not bow down to them nor worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon the children, the entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation to those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for thousands of generations to those who love me and obey my commandments. So what do we find out about God here? He's a jealous God. And he will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. So if Jesus is a little God, why would God tolerate us having affection for Jesus if Jesus is not God? That would totally contradict itself, would it not? If Jesus is not God, why in the world would we pray to a non-God? Why would we serve a non-God, and God would tolerate that. So that means that God is not jealous, any, not jealous of Jesus? Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord of heaven's armies. What does he say? I am the first and the last. There is no other God. And he tells us that he's the first and the last, also known as the Alpha and Omega. This is our God. And I want you to keep that one in mind. Remember this, that God is calling himself the first and the last. Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else nor share my praise with carved idols. So what do we learn about God on this, on, on this particular verse? That God shares his glory with no one. So we find out that God is a jealous God. We've established that. We've established that God is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. We've established that all glory is to God. He doesn't share his glory with no one. He doesn't share his, his glory with angels. He doesn't share his glory with people. He doesn't share it with the apostles. But does he share his glory with Jesus? Question mark. Wouldn't that contradict everything we are reading? It wouldn't unless Jesus is God. Next verse. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 17, all honor and glory to God forever and ever. 
He, God, is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. So even in the New Testament, we establish that all glory to God. We establish that He alone is God. We've also learned here that God never dies. So again, does God share His glory with anyone else? Would He share His glory with Jesus if Jesus is not God? That would totally contradict itself, right? So how do I know Jesus is God? Where did Jesus tell me that Jesus is God? So I'm only going to read out of the book of Revelation. When we open up for discussion, I'll let you guys share, you know, some of the verses that, that you know. But, but I, want to, I want to read out of the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Basically, give you my conclusion that Jesus is God through the book of Revelation. So Revelation, chapter 1, I'll start in verse 3. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. He blesses all who listen to the message and obey what it says, for the time is near. God blesses us for reading the book of Revelation. So if you ever want to be blessed, just open up the book of Revelation and read it. Um, he also blesses those who listen to it, and he, listen, and he blesses those who, who actually do what it says. Verse 5. He, Jesus Christ, is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. So here we read that Jesus died and rose again, right? We, verse 5 tells us that Jesus is the faithful witness, Jesus is the first to rise from the dead, and Jesus is the ruler of all the kings of the world. I continue to ver on verse 5, it says, all glory to him. Who is him? Who are we talking about right now? It says, and from Jesus Christ. Verse 5, he is a faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the world. All glory to him. To who? We're just talking about Jesus, who loves us and freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. God did not share his blood for us. He sent his son to share his blood for us. But yet, the scripture is telling us here, all glory to him. I thought we read that all glory to God and that God doesn't share his glory with no one. So unless Jesus is God, the Bible is contradicting itself. But no, the Bible does not contradict itself. Here we see that all glory to Jesus because Jesus is God. Verse 8. I don't know if I talked... Do you guys remember uh, Isaiah 44, 6? I told you to keep that one in mind because God himself said that he was the first and the last. So now verse 8. We know we're talking about Jesus. And in verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. So unless God and Jesus are coming back again, this tells me that Jesus is the one talking here, and he's calling himself the Alpha and Omega. But we know that God is the Alpha and Omega. God is the first and the last. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 9. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering. And in God's kingdom, and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us, I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. Verse 10 and 11. It was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet blast. It said, Write in a book everything you, ha you, you see and send it to the seven churches in the city of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So whose voice did John hear? 
Was it God's voice or Jesus's voice? We've kind of determined that it was Jesus's voice, right? But if you notice the voice, the sound was the sound of a trumpet blast. And so if you put your finger here in Revelation and go back to John chapter 12. <clears throat> so here John hears the voice of Jesus. And it sounds like a trumpet blast. And John chapter 12, verse 27 through 29 Jesus is talking, and he says, Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came. 28, Father, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven, saying, I have already brought glory to my name, and I will do so again. When the crowd heard the voice, some thought it was thunder while others declared an angel has spoken to him. So <clears throat> it's pretty interesting how they, Jesus and God sound alike. They both have this thunderous voice, you know? Verse 13, back to Revelation. Oh no, verse 12, 12 and 13. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven golden lampstands. And standing in the middle of the lampstand was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash around his chest. John turns around and sees Jesus. Remember, John wrote the book of John. He already knows the voice of God because he heard the voice of God and it sounded like thunder. And now he turns around, he sees, he heard this great big voice again. And it's Jesus. He turns around and it's like some, like, like the Son of Man. Jesus called himself the Son of Man. So Jesus and God have identical voices. That's because Jesus is God. Verse 14 through 16. His head and hair were like white wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves, just like God. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. So the word of God comes from Jesus' mouth. We read in John chapter 1 that Jesus is the Word, right? His face is like the sun. We know that John is describing Jesus here. He had seen this happen before in the Transfiguration as well, remember? But now Jesus here is described glowing like the sun. <clears throat> the book of Habakkuk. Chapter 3 and 4. So Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 3 and 4 says that God's splendor is like the sunrise. So not only does Jesus sound like God, but now Jesus even looks like God. So do we have two gods here? Or is Jesus God? It's the same God. Jesus is God. Verse 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at my feet as, as, as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Again, is this God or is this Jesus? Verse 17 says, when I saw him, I fell at my feet as dead. He was terrified, right? John had spent three years with Jesus. And now he sees him. And this Jesus does not look like the Jesus he remembers. This is like, he's seeing God here. 
and he falls like he's dead. But then this gentle voice of Jesus says, it's okay, don't be afraid. And he says, I am the first and the last. Isn't that what God said in Isaiah? But we know that this is Jesus because verse 18 tells us. Verse 18 says, I am the living one. <clears throat> I died. But look, I am alive forever and ever. And, be, and I hold the keys to death and the grave. Again, Jesus is God here. He claims to be the Alpha and Omega. the first and the last. If Jesus is not God, then the whole Bible contradicts itself. Then it means we have two gods. And we know that that isn't so because God gave us commandments. There should be, you should have no other gods before you. God is a jealous God. God does not share his glory with no one. And so that's my conclusion. My conclusion is that Jesus is God. And I close with um, John chapter 20. Verse 28. So Jesus chose 12, 12 apostles. These 12 apostles were Jews. Do you think they knew the Ten Commandments? Commandment number one, you shall have no other God before me. Right? So do you think these guys knew the Ten Commandments? They've been walking with Jesus for three years. Do you think they knew God's commands? Do you think they knew that God is a jealous God? Do you think they knew that... God doesn't share his glory with no one. I think they did. I'll start at verse 26. This is, eight, this is after Jesus has, has risen from the dead. Verse 26 says, Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look. Put your hand in my wound, in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Thomas exclaimed, my Lord, my God. If Thomas is calling Jesus God, that would go totally against everything God has ever taught him. He knows that, they only have, that we only have one God. Why would he call a man God? This is my conclusion is that Jesus is God. And I'll open up for discussion. I want to hear what you guys think. If you guys have any other verses, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other verses that prove that Jesus is God. And that's the whole purpose of this. Is Jesus God? And if so, how do we know that he's God? Beautiful study, Ponzi. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> what convinced me that Jesus was God was when I was in the book of John, because it's so very clear there. But I was sharing with, some, with someone that didn't believe, and they, they had gone through the book of John, and they just kind of put mm -hmm. it aside, even though the word was Jesus and all of that. And they still kind of believed that Jesus was an angel. And I didn't know how to deal with it then. But I just, oh, some time ago, found this. In Hebrews chapter 1, long ago, beginning at verse 1, long ago and many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke to us by his son, there's Jesus whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. How could Jesus not be God if he didn't create the world? So I went on. He is the radiance of the glory of God. And you spoke about that. You spoke about Jesus receiving the glory of God. And right there it is, just in this Hebrews right here. The glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus has every single attribute that God has. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Jesus, in the flesh, had a human, but he still was God, God in the flesh. And it goes on to say down here, 
Of which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? He never told the angels. And the angels never claim to be God except one. And that was Lucifer. And we know where he's at. But when you realize that Jesus created everything that we see, how could he not be God? That was beautiful for me and for somebody else that I was sharing with at the time. Jesus is our creator, and therefore he has to be God. So I'll open it up to somebody else. You did a great job, Ponce, of uh, the comparing scriptures, the beginning and the end. That was that was ties it all in. That was great. Mm -hmm. um, I got. I was uh, <clears throat> when I first became a believer, new believer. I uh, had a next door neighbor, and we became good friends. And he was Jehovah Witness. And so he started sharing, you know, his information. And my mother-in-law told me to be careful who you listen to. And um, so, you know, I was just going along listening, but it was, it was conflicting with what I was getting in church. So um, you know what direction I went. But someone came to my, one of the Jehovah's came to my door one day. And so I asked them, I said, well, is, you know, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Oh, well, yeah, you know, he was a good teacher. I said, that's not what I asked you. <clears throat> you know, you give me all this information. It's Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Well, he's a prophet. So right there, you know, it's like, you know, so you're talking about your friend that was married at Jehovah's Witness and was converted. Um, then he must not have been strong with the word because Right here, what you just went over definitely shows that Jesus is Lord. And so um, even as a new believer, I, I wasn't swayed. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're very persuasive, but I wasn't persuaded because I was hearing conflicting information. <clears throat> and the Bible does not contradict itself, as you pointed out. Um, I like where you, in verse three in Revelation, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. That's, that's right there, that did it for me. So, uh, yeah, I, re I remember that, that guy. We had a, actually a pastor at our, uh, our small church in Hayward. Uh, he's now a pastor and he was a Jehovah's. And he, our pastor, they worked at uh, NUMI when NUMI was there in Fremont. And they used to have Bible studies during lunchtime. And he happened to be in the lunchroom one day and started, uh, you know, discussing. And, I mean, he converted. He's now a pastor. He actually he lives in um, Vacaville right now. We, we still talk. We play golf. Mm -hmm. And he is now a pastor and was a full job witness. So that was good. Um. Yeah, it's a great study. Um, any teaching that doesn't teach that um, that Jesus is the preeminent one in salvation um, is not the gospel. So, brothers, we should beware of any of that kind of teaching if it's not straight from the Word of God. Um, great study. Yeah. Um, let's let's look at uh, John chapter eight. Well, let's start in verse fifty-two. So Jesus is um, he's having a discussion with the Pharisees, and they can't they can't prove that what he's saying is wrong or not uh, biblical or unbiblical. So they are insulting him. Um. So verse 52, the people said, now we know that you are possessed by a demon. Even Abraham and the prophets died, but you say anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus answered, if I want glory for myself, it doesn't count. But it is my father who will glorify me. You say he is our God, but you don't even know him. I know him. 
If I said otherwise, I would be as great a liar as you. But I do know him and obey him. Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. The people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you have seen Abraham? Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. So right there in that statement, he's telling them that he's God. Back in um, Exodus, and I don't, um, someone else probably knows the chapter and verse better. Um, Moses was talking to God on Mount Sinai. And um, he was very nervous about going to talk to Pharaoh. And then, um, and he even said, well, um, what do I tell, what do I tell the people? What do I tell your people when I go back? And then who, who's, who do I tell them sent me? And he said, tell them I am sent me. Someone might have the chapter and verse. And I hope I'm close on that in uh, Exodus. Um, so then you come back here and he, and the people, the people knew the scriptures, right? So the people he was talking to the audience knew the scriptures very well. So when he says, I am, he's telling them I'm God. That's Exodus three fourteen. Exodus three fourteen. Okay. God Thank said you. To Moses, I am who I am. This is what you want to say to the Israelites. I am and sent me to you. Another thing that I was trying to find the scripture because we're dealing with so many different spirits out there: the Jehovah Witness, the Catholics, and Mormons, and you name it. But so how do you test the spirits? You get them to admit that Jesus was God in the flesh when he was on this earth. Right now, you know where he's at. He's up there in heaven. So anyway, I'll open it up to some more of you brothers. You're all doing a great job. You know, going back to the linear uh, survey that D Doyle was talking about, it's troubling because the survey, 30% of evangel evangelical reject the deity of christ so it's not just the jw's it's within the church 30 percent of them don't believe that jesus is god and that's exactly why we study the bible because it's not in just one place but what convinced me also was with a brother really sat down and we went through the book of john very slowly just like Tang said there. And then when we get that, you can go into the other parts of the Bible and just like Ponzi did, it's, it's all over. It's in every script. It even starts in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God, right there. Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. <clears throat> it goes along with the theme, but it's also important. Um, it's about um, the, the, fruit, the fruit of repentance. If we don't have fruit of repentance, then this could be us. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. <clears throat> Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles then i will tell them plainly i never knew you away from me you evildoers verse 24 therefore anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock the rain came down the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. That's because he was God. Because he is God. Amen. And is to come. Amen.
the most important thing is how we believe on Jesus Christ. We see in Matthew chapter 16, how Peter confessed Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of living God. In our life, in our, my, ourselves, we have to confess Jesus, like as Peter, you are Christ, the Son of living God. It is very important for us. Good reminder. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way to, to, to conclude this by, by asking the question, so who do you say Jesus is? Jesus asked that to Peter and them, and Peter answered, so who do we say Jesus is? I say yes. Yes. And remember who gave him the answer. Who did Peter receive that answer from? The Holy Spirit. That's right. Amen. The Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. That's right. Yes. And that's what speaks to us is the Holy Spirit today. Right. Where else do we get the truth? It comes from the Holy Spirit speaking to us through what? The written word yes. or through the messengers. Amen. Boy, we have to be very careful. But we have the Holy Spirit, and that's where the truth is revealed. And that's what's missing in some of our brothers and sisters. They, they think that they have <laughs> maybe the true knowledge, but they're missing the most important ingredient, the Holy Spirit. Sure. Father, we thank you for this great study, Lord, because it's very important that we know who's in charge of our future. It's Jesus Christ. He's the one that we have to trust and obey and believe and do all of these things, Father, because we are the one that's following him. We're not the ones that are doing the leading. He's doing the leading. And we must learn how to follow. Help us today to follow what it is that you want each of us to do. And let us be faithful to who and to what you are. You are God and there is no other. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.